And now I'm going to introduce Bennett. Hi. Bennett is an <laughs> organic landscape horticulturalist at the 577 Foundation. He has an extensive background in landscape design, horticulture, and nursery sales. He gained gardening experience in Arizona, Southwest Ohio, and South Carolina before he moved to Toledo in 2020. Bennett was also the Southwestern Ohio Regional Reporter for the Ohio Gardener Magazine for several seasons. He has shared his expertise in gardening with native plants through presentations with our Wild Ones chapter and has served as a trainer for our local Master Rain Gardener program. And I would like to say that Bennett's programs on our YouTube channel are the most watched presentations Yay. of any of our presentations. The bribery is so Very popular. <laughs> so, yes. I do Bennett Dowling and well, he'll take it away. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming out. I know I've seen some of you before and I'm always excited to see new faces. So, I, I for some reason was living in a dream world where we have daylight till like nine still. So, we won't, we won't dilly dally. But, um, this is a program I've taught many years in different places I've lived. I'm a big key fan of planting a tree real properly and what you'll see is we're, the most important thing you can do with a tree is really getting that root system pried apart. And most of the things the books tell you still aren't aggressive enough. So we got a black gum today, which is a tree that is notoriously heavy and deep rooted. So a big black gum in that small of a pot, I'm pretty excited this root system might be a disaster. <laughs> but we'll see, it might not. But um, we're going to cover some of the different things to go over. We're also going to look at what to look for if you're looking at a tree at a nursery or this and that. Um, this is obviously a bigger tree than a lot of you might be starting with, but this is also, in nursery standards, this is still kind of a small tree. This is considered, I think they said it was a 15 gallon, and I was like, wow. that kind of looks a little for a 15 gallon to me. But, um, but it's, um, you know, potted trees are great. The thing that's hard with potted trees is um, the roots are, you know, the old-fashioned method with growing trees was always to grow them in a field, dig them, burlap them, and bring them to the landscape. So those roots were natural because they'd always been allowed to grow in all their normal natural directions. When you grow trees in pods, they, um, they transplant easier because they haven't gone through all that digging, but they also can have really bad habits they've picked up in that pot. And a tree root, if you don't straighten it out or do what you need to do, it will continue to grow in a circle for its life. And as it, as it expands just the way a tree trunk expands and keeps growing in caliper, a, a root will do the same as the tree grows and it can slowly strangle itself. Like, a, like a, well, yeah, exactly, a girdling root. It's like a boa constrictor, it will slowly. So you see a lot of maples in people's yards will get just the right size and they start getting red, they start flagging. Maples are notorious for after about 15 years killing themselves if the roots weren't loosened properly. So, um, so this one might be great, it might not. But I did want to go over now, if you're coming over here, be careful. This little dirt spot here is where I tried to dig a hole and it turned out there was a black locust under there 20 years ago to show you how long black locust would last. You still couldn't get through it. Um, so, Y'all want to come take a look. What you want to look for when you're at a nursery, and these are important things that we're going to look for as part of the planting process, too. We're going to go over some terminology here. One of the most important things you're looking for with a tree is what's called the root flare. So the root flare is it's where the tree transitions into the ground. A uh, tree should never just go straight into the ground like a pole. They should always start to kind of come out, just like when you think of flying buttresses on an old cathedral trees should have a similar shape. So if you're planting a tree and it looks like a broomstick going straight into the ground, it means where it should be is too deep in the soil. So when I'm looking at a nursery, I try to make sure that hopefully I'm seeing some of that gradual tapering out. Okay. So this one's lovely. This is like, you're already seeing, there's one of the, the roots coming out. Um, so those would be called buttress or buttress roots, they often call them, but really the term is root flare. It's just flaring outwards. Um, we're also going to look and make sure, you know, there's no major wounds on the trunk. Now, if I'm paying like 50% off in the fall, I'm willing to tolerate some more wounds than I am with a full price tree. Um, you want to look for that. You want to make sure the growth habit is reasonably good. If you're buying a tree that's on a great discount, but it's because it's got such a bad growth pattern at the top that you'd have to prune a ton out to even get it on the right track, it might not be worth the money. This like one, at Lowe's or Home Depot. Or yeah, you might be in trouble with some of those. Like local. But like this, you see, 
he's got most trees like to have what they call a central leader, which would be the, the, the rocket shooting out of the top that's going to guide the rest of the tree. So this type of a tree, you see it's got this great straight top. Um, and that's really the most important thing. I don't see any um, unhealthy crossing areas. I don't see a lot of um, wounds on the upper areas. Um, you try to make sure you don't see a lot of real tight, these would be called crotches, um, or the crotch angles. You don't want to see branches so tight together that they're um, unhealthy. Um, but the, the reason we're looking at this is the old method was to prune trees a lot right when you planted them to make up for the root damage that you were doing. But most research is showing now that you need to prune as little as possible the first year or two with a new tree. It's amazing. The cells that are in the ends of growth branches are also correlate to the cells at the ends of root, root tips. So if you remove all the ends of the branches up here, you're slowing down the roots availability to also grow. So they found out 50 years ago, people would have said, we well, are cutting off 20% of the roots planting the tree. You gotta cut off 20% of the top. That's not the case anymore. So the only pruning we would do today is if there was anything really obviously wrong. You know, so, um, let's see. I think I got my weapon in here, Ken. Okay. So first and foremost, oh, sorry. So, so for example, the only thing I would do maybe today is you see like there's, this is what would be considered a, a really tight. That's the only thing I noticed. Yeah, that little guy's silly. Um, and this wouldn't be needed for this, but what we could do is I'm gonna lay this guy down for a minute. What? Sorry. <laughs> okay. What? <laughs> I don't think you knew how dangerous classes are here. <laughs> Girl, you, we might all make it through this, but no guarantees. Okay, so what you could do is see, let's pretend that this tree has two tops, which would be two lengths that are the same length and not one of them's dominant. What you could do is you could assert the top by clipping one. And so if that one was like, if they looked like they were gonna be fighting to see who's the leader, you could just shorten one or two. But other than that, we're not gonna cut the ends off of a lot of them like they would have 30 years ago when they were planting trees. Otherwise, this tree looks fine. If you did say it's a pretty healthy It's stuff. a great shaped tree. If you did see any other things though, branches that are crossing into each other, you know, branches that are rubbing against each other, like long term, we would take this little guy off because he's just growing right into the middle of the tree. You know, we don't want that. How and, about, is this a crutch? Right here. Yeah, I saw that one. Yeah, that one would be one, and that's another one. What you could do is you could also shorten that branch for now at the top just to prevent that one from becoming equally dominant, and then another year or two down the line, you could start to correct that. Yes, that is a good eye. So, this which you one? would take care of this one that's growing more at an angle? That one's, yeah, that one's a great angle. This one, let's oh. see which one. Oh no, is that the one we're talking about? Yeah. yeah. I don't think I am too worried. About, this little guy would probably long term come off. Oh, okay. But right now, really, I'm only going to worry about really bad stuff. So, like that one could be like that. But you know, since Oops. you pointed out, it's not, it's not going to hurt really it to take off that there. little one. <laughs> right there. Oh, yeah. So you see, we've done a very minimal amount. So, um, other than that, we don't need to do a lot. Now, I will tell you, these poles. A really bad thing you would do would be to leave this pole in when you plant it. Whenever you buy a tree and it has this bamboo rod, that is what I always say is that's for shipping. That has nothing to do with supporting the tree. It's to protect it in shipping and transit. And really all it's doing is weakening the tree because one thing, you'd never want something pressing up against your bark 24-7. Another thing, it is um, you want a tree to be able to move in the wind. the wind. If it doesn't, it doesn't develop the strength it needs. So what happens is this is like, like having a crutch all the time with you, where if you have, uh, if you stake it and doing it a little further away so that the tree has a little bit of wiggle room, it's gonna be able to develop more strength. And is this also like rubbing the... Uh, what that uh, is, is probably, um, Oh. Sometimes they use like this landscape tape that scares me. I always think that there's either a piece of bark falling off or it's oh. just old biodegradable tape. Okay. And then you ignore things like this. They always paint them in nursery fields for God knows what yeah, reasons. It means something to them. Yeah. But um, <laughs> let's see. 
Make sure you always take these things off, any of these tags, because what will happen often, especially when you're buying a tree, make sure if it's in one of these, these branch crotches, often the tree will grow around it and then that gets stuck in the tree permanently. I don't so, remember what it is. You're just going to have to. <laughs> well, you know how many years I've been working in this industry and I never keep the tags because I'm like, I'll remember that. And then a year later, someone's yeah. like, what type of cone flower is that? And I'm like, you know, I rest my case. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. So, and then we just got our last one right here. Um, so that is the funny thing is often the tree roots grow around them. So. Then it may ask where you got the tree. He is from North Branch because we have no other options in this dang city. But yes. It is a nice quality. It's a nice black gum. I was happy. I have generally been very happy with the quality of their trees. We'll leave that in for now. But um, I think it's really in there. I think what I'll do is get a saw tomorrow and just cut it off at the ground because it shouldn't be. like the bark is or the trunk is I know, right? So, um, okay, so now what we're going to do is so I gave you a sheet that kind of talks about some of the ins and outs. We are going to go into what we're looking for with the roots now. Um, so just the same, essentially you want to picture the canopy of the tree being the same as the root system. Just as the top of the tree, we want all those branches radially going out like spokes on a wheel. We want the roots to look like that too. We don't want a lot of them noticeably going into each other. We don't want them growing in circles. You wouldn't buy a tree where all the branches are curling in like that. So. Whenever you see a tree, you have to essentially assume the branch system of the roots is very similar. Now, it is a myth that trees have roots as deep as the top. That's very rare with most trees. Most trees, the majority of the surface or roots are in the top 18 to 24 inches of soil. That's why droughts are so bad with old trees. They don't have deep, deep roots like you think. But yes, we do want to look for that soil or the, the, um, the growth habit. Uh, what we can do is, like I said, uh, Potted trees being the dominant thing have maybe been the past 40 or 50 years. The nursery industry up until then was entirely ball and burlap, which is what they call it when it's a root ball in a burlap sack. If you go to Wildwood, in the stables there, they have photos of the estate being built. If you look, they had American elm trees being brought in burlap with root balls bigger than this car, really? dragged in by horses, <laughs> and that was when we could still grow American elms. And um, at that time period, that was, they were burlap. They didn't have potted trees. So the reason I bring that up is to transplant a tree out of a field and ball and burlap it, you cut up to 70% of the roots off. When we plant a tree from this pot, if we didn't do any root loosening, we are planting it with 100% of its roots. So when we go at this and start really damaging roots and breaking them apart and cutting them off, just remember that's still it's still retaining a lot more roots than the old-fashioned trees that they planted just fine with no problems. So we have a lot of wiggle room to work with. And I learned a lot from Dave Gressley, who's the head horticulturist at Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati. It's the Arboretum there. And the first time I saw him plant a tree, I almost started weeping. I was like, <laughs> good God. Um, and he, doing yeah, and we would teach classes together. Every single tree we taught or planted was doing great five years later. It, but some of them you're taking down to literally no soil on the roots after a while. So really it's good to kind of loosen the roots. Um, the good thing is this one isn't real root bound. Now what you want to do is when you're getting ready to take a tree out of its pot, you want to look and see if there's a lot of roots growing out of the holes in the pot. You just want to come and just kind of cut them off. If you're not wanting to pound the tree out of a pot lot, obviously you can just cut the pot off. But a lot of these I like to hold on to if possible for other uses here. So let's see. See if it's going to slide right out of there. Yeah, of course. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm, did I hit you? I'm sorry. Why we signed the waiver. To just absolutely mouse. This is why they have the disclaimer for everyone. It's just because I'm teaching. I haven't signed off on that. Oh, God. We Quit signed your name. Sign it, John. We signed okay, your name. Okay, well, she might not be able to take it out John, from, from the know. organization, but she still might be able to take it out of you. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, I always cut my... You want me to grab the bottom of it? I'm trying to figure out what he's stuck on. Yep, yeah, you don't mind. Let's high. see. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. I think what it is, we might slice it off. I think it's the um, bamboo rod is somewhere oh. in the middle, maybe. 
because there's no root coming out of the bottom. Yeah. Okay. So normally it's a lot easier once you pound it that bit. Sometimes. <laughs> this feels like it should slip out. It feels like it's very loose. Something's going on down here. I'm hoping it's treasure. <laughs> But that might be naive of me. Keep that optimism. <laughs> Your finger oh, right there. <laughs> oh, but I'd get a week or two off. Let's do it. Let's see. Uh. Ah, there we go. Where are we stuck on, Kay? Oh, there is. What on earth was happening? Okay. So these are not bad roots, y'all. I'm no, very no. happy. Good job, North Branch. <laughs> this is a sponsored message. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, wow. I'm an influencer now. Oh, thank you. I'm going to grab, okay, so I don't know if y'all have this. I'm going to say the greatest garden tool you can ever have is a soil knife. I could get them from Am Leonard because it is an Ohio-based company. So you're supporting Piqua, Ohio's economy. Um, soil knives, though, are super useful. They have a serrated edge, so you're great for sawing through roots. They have um, a sharper, uh, just more of a normal knife edge, and even kind of something for opening bags or uh, pulling stuff open. So I've always had them around. I always lose at least three a season, yeah. um, and they're expensive, so that's a really bad thing. Um, so the reason I like this is, with this more dull side of it, the less serrated you can get in under your roots and not be cutting through them, where if you did it on this side, your, the roots are pulling into the sharp sides of the knife. So you have that option. But what we're looking for, if y'all want to take a look, is see, these are roots that could potentially be what we call the girdling roots. Mm -hmm. See how they're going in circles around? Um, those would be some, if we never loosened those at all, as they keep widening and widening, they could eventually keep twisting around the, the tree's crown. So, so first we look for things like that. And we start just kind of coming in really hoping this would be more root bound, which is not something I'd normally hope for. <laughs> for demonstrating yeah. these for purposes the only. The one time I need a poorly potted tree, I get a great one. Should have went to Lowe's. Should have gone to Lowe's, girl. Get that discount rack tree, that weeping willow they potted two years ago and just left it in that pot. Okay, no, so. No water. No water. <laughs> so, so I like to come all the way through and then I usually get my hands in there and feel around a little because the other thing you'll often find is trees since as they grow they'll keep moving them from one pot size to the bigger pot size to the bigger size often they didn't loosen those roots since they did it before so it might look great out here but then you feel two inches down and it's a solid brick of bad roots so then that's where you do and then pry so this is one this looks horrible but what, by doing this, you're literally just loosening up because this is where you're going to see a lot of your damage or a lot of your dangerous roots in the tree is that bottom edge is often where it's going to be like a solid mass of roots. What you can do in those areas if you can't, like if you do this and then just pull down, that often loosens it enough. But if you don't have that option, if it's just so solid, don't think too much of just coming through and just literally sawing off that outer edge. Um, but you see what you want is you want to see all these as many roots as possible facing out we don't want to see anyone circling around That's the bad part. Um, but like i said if i was doing this with the sharp sides facing out i'd be cutting those roots as i'm lifting since i'm going smooth side out it's like doing it with a spoon this way it's just lifting more than cutting and you can go down like that or you can pry up um, and like I said, you don't have to have a soil knife for this. You could do this with a hand trowel. If you don't have want to do it that way and you need a little bit easier, you can literally um, take, like the old method was to take a, a, like a sharp pruner or knife and slice down four or five sides and then pry apart that way. But often a really root-bound tree that doesn't work very well. And the one drawing I, I had on there, I think it shows the tree in the hole where some people will actually stand it up in the hole mm -hmm. and then take a sharp shovel and cut the outer two inches of the root ball off all the way around as if you're like cutting the crust off of bread, so like off of a sandwich and you don't want the crust, just cutting it all off so that that way 
what that's doing is removing all those circling roots and taking it back down to the roots that are um, sticking out. So it seems very, very aggressive, but like I said, remember a potted tree, we are preserving so many more roots than the ball and burlap trees. So we have a lot of room to do damage. The other good thing is fall, which is the best time to plant trees. Doing this to them is so much less stressful this time of year than in the spring. In the spring, they're putting all their energy into the top. So if you're damaging the roots, they're like, ah! But in the fall, they're putting all their energy into root growth. So they're gonna recover a lot faster. They're also um, coming into the cooler time of year. They're coming into more moist weather. Usually in the fall, we have just milder temperatures, milder air. And the ground doesn't freeze until later than people think. You know, it's quite a while before the ground really freezes. January. Some years it doesn't freeze at all. December, January. Yeah, okay. this past winter it barely froze. So, yeah. so your roots are going to keep growing actively often into January, February, some winters kind of the whole time if the ground's not frozen. So, so I'd say planting in the fall is ideal. Even better for this type of stuff is often when the trees are already starting to go dormant. So up into November. When we were talking about moving trees, moving shrubs and trees in like November, I always like if I had a break in the weather in early December in Cincinnati, I'd get out there and start moving shrubs, moving young trees. I never had a problem because they're putting all that energy into root development. So, so we've got a really nice, healthy, beautiful baby here. Um, and if any of you want to feel in here, we can feel there is no... I'm, when, I'm, when I'm doing that, I'm trying to feel in there and see, is there like, is it like a solid wall of roots just a few inches down in there? See, you can feel it. There's nothing. We're good. No treasure, though. So good. <laughs> <laughs> fingers crossed. But yeah, you're just trying to feel in there. It's, it's nice and yeah, So I'm going to call Ashley at North Ranch and say, good job, girl. <laughs> so, so we got Ask that, that ready. Check. Now I'm going to, you what? Ask for that check when you call Ashley. Exactly. <laughs> So, check. Yeah. now the next thing we want to do is, I might not have dug the hole deep enough because I wanted to see what we're actually looking at, but it might be just fine. So, when we're going to plant the tree, you want to do the depth of the root ball is equal, it, you know, you want the tree either level with the soil or about an inch above the soil. Um, too deep is always going to eventually cause trouble. Too high can also cause trouble. Man, I'm sorry, you're talking about where the... Where the root flare is, I'm sorry, yeah. Flare. Yes, okay. thank you for saying that, actually, because a lot of landscapers kill trees because they'll plant the tree to the depth of what it is in the pot without making sure they found where the actual root flare is. Um, so what you need to do is, that's why you always feel around on the soil. Even here, really, you see where this root flare is? This is actually mounted up higher around it. I actually come in and loosen that, too, to get it all level. And that's actually a good way to also discover if there's any more trouble roots. Uh, what you can do with a tree, this one's fine, but you'll often look at the roots here. If you see any that are running alongside the trunk, you often just cut those off because they could be one that eventually strangles it. So luckily this guy doesn't have any, but if you saw one that was kind of circling around down here, just chop it, get it out of there. Because um, remember, the tree can handle a lot more root damage when it's this young than you think it can. So she's ready. Now I'm going to show you a technique that I learned for finding the depth of a tree for your hole is essentially taking one shovel and so essentially you would just kind of take a little bit of mud and mark where that is on there. Stick that down in the hole. So there's our little mud mark. Okay, everyone stand back just in case she's a topsy-turvy tree. And then if you have another shovel or just any other metal uh, long pole of any kind of straight, lay it across the hole. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Isn't that great? Yeah. I know, this is why it's good to know horticulturists. I learned this from my man Dave and he, oh, I almost cried. So, so look at that. So the good thing is that's either level or if, if this was an inch above, I'm not gonna worry. But if we got it in there and it's like that far below, we got to put soil in the bottom. The other thing with digging the hole, you usually want to do the hole, if possible, twice the diameter of the root ball. Or if you can't, I, like if it's a really big tree, you know, like a 25 gallon tree, you're not going to dig a hole that's that big unless you're going to make it a pool. 
It's the only time it's worth making a hole that big. <laughs> You're going to call it tree people. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So what I like to do is if I'm not going to dig it twice as wide, I just want to try to get it wide enough that if I hold the shovel blade perpendicular to the tree trunk, there's that space. Because what you don't want to do is shoehorn it into the ground. If you are putting it into a hole so tight that you can't even get your hand in there to kind of make sure it's compacted and stuff, you're doing a disservice. So you got to... I had a crew guy in South Carolina, he'd plant so fast and he was so proud of it, but you'd see the hole he dug, it was like slip covering a sofa. He would get it <laughs> so tight, I'd be like, Jaime, good God, did you have to put like Vaseline on it? How did you? And he'd be like, I planted 23 shrubs. I, yeah, and I was like, yeah, well, three of them were good. Um, so, so now when you look at that though, it, did, it does seem a little settled. So what we'll do is we'll just bring a little bit of soil in there. Don't worry about stomping on it or anything because you don't want to compact the soil a lot. You can just kind of do this and then we'll see. So that looks better. It's a little bit above soil grade. Um, you kind of try to make sure which side you think is the best side, which this guy's got a lot of good sides. Um, I think this is the side my boss liked with the more branches were here. Um, so, so that's pretty much in there at a good depth. And then we're just going to backfill it. You don't add anything, Bennett? I don't, you know. So the worst thing you can do is replace the soil. That's what people used to always do. They'd say, oh, fill it with topsoil when you're done. But that causes what they call a bathtub effect, where you have such an incompatibility between soils that one drains differently than the other one, and you can have sitting water, which a black gum would love sitting water, so it'd probably be fine with it. Um, but no, what we would do here is if you are going to amend your soil, do no more than maybe 30% is what they say. So if you were going to do that, I try to dig the hole even wider. And this is why I love having a tarp down when not only are you gonna to have to sift grass and, or soil out of your grass, it's easier to clean up, but you can also either on a tarp or on a wheelbarrow, add your compost if you did want to and mix it all there and then dump it all in the hole. So, so it's easy cleanup, it's also easy mixing. Now anything you broke off, you know, when you were doing that soil. I'm putting that back in. Oh yeah, this yeah, is good stuff. So this would be the only amending I'd do is just because this is kind of like saying, I know this is where you grew up. I'm going to give you a little, but welcome to the real right. world. It's like dropping the kid off at college. Here's your favorite blanket. Um, gotta go. <laughs> at least that was my experience was. Um, don't know. So, so essentially what you could do is, and then if you did want, um, I'm going to have to water this tomorrow because I forgot. They disconnected the hose for something else earlier today. What you could do though is you would put maybe, uh, some people will actually, before I've got it completely backfilled, I'll actually add water a lot that there's water standing in there a little bit. Let that go down and then add the rest of the soil. Just to, the main reason you're watering a tree is not even so much to help uh, get the tree established, but to get those air pockets out of the soil and to see how much compaction you have. I often don't get my soil out of the way till the next day because often when you've watered it a few times the soil is going to settle so much more than you realize and you're like, oh, well, I took all my soil somewhere else. So, um, so you, even if you get it nice and level, water it in, you're going to see a lot of that's going to settle more. But um, people used to always like stand on the soil, compact it in. I still do sometimes, but I've known a lot of horticulturists who are like, don't do that. Just let the water do the compacting you're okay. needing. Um, because especially if you have a heavier clay, not so much here, but a heavy clay, if you stand on it, everything you're doing that's compacting clay, it's hard to undo. Where soils like this that are real loamy, compaction isn't as, as damaging. But so, so you can let the water do a lot of that compacting, getting the air pockets out, getting the trees settled. Um, that would be the main thing there. Um, are there any questions so far? I'm sorry, I kind of go fast, kind of fast, okay. Are you going to wait to take rich. that bamboo out soil until after it's Yeah, well, it's mostly because it's stuck in there for eternity. What I'll probably do is tomorrow I have a nice little hand saw. I'll come out here and just end up probably just cutting off this thing real low because that will biodegrade. It's just bamboo. Um, usually, sometimes it's even about a 50% chance of them pulling right out beautifully, and other times they're so stuck in there you just leave it. Um, but you do want to make sure you get it out. Now what we will go over though is real quickly some staking methods. I brought some different things out here. So I'm not a big 
I don't really worry about staking all that often, I have to admit, unless it's a really exposed area or if it's an extremely top-heavy tree. Something like this, I'm not worried about, especially as we get later in the season when it starts losing its leaves. It's, it's not a lot of top heaviness. Oh, why, thank you. I guess I could just... See, look, it's like CrossFit, y'all. <laughs> I'm like, it's just multidisciplinary. Fitness, planting, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I don't really generally stake a whole lot. Um, but what I what is good to do is so you have multiple methods of staking. So North Branch, when they stake, they do a beautiful job. They use wooden posts, but they usually will do a tripod situation where they'll have, you know, three pounded into the ground with the guy wires. I don't like it in a public spot because it's very easy for people to not notice and trip over them. I prefer to do, you know, two posts. But but the nice thing with the guy wires one is you 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 want it loose enough that the tree can move a little. You don't want it when you do it so tight that this tree is like, you can't even move it at all. So either of them, what I do though, is I would take my posts, you know, you'll do them a distance enough around that, obviously we're not going to actually do it tonight, but you do it far, far enough out that you're not overly supporting the tree. And then when you have the wire, if you can, it's important. Oh, thank you. Yeah, if you can, whether it's it's in the, um, uh, if you have wire or whatever you're using to t tie it, if, if you can, whether you're doing the tripod method or this, try to get the wire or tie-offs not below the entire canopy, but somewhere into the canopy. Because you figure if you tied it all off here and all that weight in the wind is above the tie-off, you can have a tree that will snap off. But if it's up in here, it's it, a lot of the wind blowing stress is actually in the core of the weight area as opposed to yeah and it's one i never would have thought of but it makes a lot of sense um so that's a way to go about it um so usually things like this we might you know if i do stake it which i might just so that people don't bump into it um i would by next year not even be worried anymore this would be just to get it through winter maybe but yeah tying it off through there the main thing you want to do though is if you have an old garden hose, uh, put your wire through that. I don't remember where my wire is. Let's see. Um, so if you have like a, if you're using any kind of wire, there's any kinds of things you could do. But if you have some our old garden hose, wherever this is going to wrap around the tree trunk, you want something to disperse so you don't have a wire going into the tree. You want something that can soften it up. Um, they I've sell those things. Hmm? Like, um, they sell those. I think they elastic, do. Elastic, like it. Um, black oh, yeah, they do. Colors. There are nice. You just want anything exactly to disperse like, it. Just the same as if you imagine, what would I rather be wearing as a bracelet? <laughs> something this tight? Imagine what would I be wearing as, a, as an anklet after Thanksgiving when our ankles swell up a little? Do I want this cutting into ankles or do I want like a beautiful thick band? So, a, burlap. a beautiful burlap jewelry. Um, I've done with burlap, if I'm in a pinch, just kind of wrapping it around where the wire is going to go to the tree. A lot of people will use just an old hose, cut that hose and run the wire through it. And then that way, when you wrap your wire around the trunk, there's nothing cutting into the trunk. A one is if any of you are a cyclist, old bike, uh, the, not the tires, but the actual tubes are fabulous for it. The tubes hold up well. They have the least, um, they have more friction, so they don't slide as much, and they're great. Um, so, so those are all options. But the main thing being, when you stake a tree, you always want to have something to break up that all that pressure being in such a skinny little area. The other thing you want to do, and I've noticed this a lot in Perrysburg with the forestry department, they'll stake trees and then not unstake them soon enough, and then the trees grow around the, the hose or whatever they had here. So it's, it's easy for a tree to grow around this, but even if you have a hose or something, don't think that's going to prevent the tree from growing around it. So I've seen trees here that were perfectly healthy, but now they have a hose stuck in them, you know, so that's going to weaken the tree and make it prone to break there. So um, that would be the only other thing I would say is figure out a way that you can disperse um, the pressure um, where it is wrapped around the tree. Um, with the staking, you could do 
Um, I usually do at least, you know, a steak on each side. You could do three sides, but um, but just enough that, like I said, when you're when you're done doing it, I want to be able to just move the tree a little bit. Um, so you don't want it so tight that it's up. Um, and that would be the same whether you do the low uh, kind of teepee method or the tall stakes. You want that movement. Um, but like I said, very often you don't need it. You know, I mean, a lot of people stake trees so much and, and really they, they stand up fine on their own. And the last thing this time of year, it's very important to do, if you have deer or rabbits, which just about all of us have rabbits, um, it's really important to get some sort of a protection around the trunk. September through March is what they call rutting season. It's where the male deer are putting their scent on things and also trying to get the velvet off their antlers. So what they do is they see young trees as ideal because the forks and the antlers can go right around that. It's part of it, yeah. They're teenagers, so they're destructive. <laughs> I'm not saying that yet because I'm sure you're getting close to teenage years, but I'm sure you'll be nice and polite. But boys, destructive. So um, what we need to do is try to prevent that. And September, like I said, through March, I've noticed the rutting season seems to get longer some years. I've had years where I took them all off March 1st, and then the year came and wiped out my trees. Um, especially trees that have smooth bark. They love the smooth. I've never seen them do it to like a, a river birch or something with real flaky bark, but you put a, a magnolia, a tulip tree, this would be just wonderful for them. A, a young maple. The, the coarser and more chunky a bark is, the less they're interested. So young trees with that smooth, silky bark, they're all about it. So what I like to do is find some sort of caging. There are nice, they call them deer guards. You can buy a lot of nurseries, just a nice hard plastic, very easy to cut. Um, this I'm using like old, just grill. Um, some of it's often the stuff they use in gutters to prevent leaves from going in it. I use whatever I can find around here, but <laughs> tying it off, making sure that you tie it off at multiple points. I've done sometimes just the bottom and the top, but then what happens is often through the season it kind of bows out and then you have this big open area in the middle that they can get into. So I try to get it at least middle and top, but middle, top, and bottom is important because the other thing we have to worry about is rabbits will chew bark off of new trees very often. So if we don't have the bottom protected well, the deer, we're protecting from the deer, but the rabbits are going to come and just chew um, that's the worst with um, witch hazels, apples, um, lilacs, a lot of those cherries. Anything in that family, the rabbits love the bark. Um, so, so we got to do something if we don't have deer and we're, so we're not worried about rutting. I still will always get a little bit of caging around the bottom foot of the tree. What do you think about pruning? Is that not good? About what? A prune. I don't mind it during the winter. So here's the deal, anything like that. So pool noodles are um, often you'll see when trees are from nurseries, they have like that hard plastic like wrap on them. Things like that, or I've even seen the corrugated tubing like that you can buy at the hardware store. All of that's fine in the winter because we don't have a lot of humidity and disease pressure. But once we get into that warmer, humid weather, you want as much airflow on a truck as possible. Pool noodle though in the winter isn't necessarily bad because it's also going to insulate it. Okay. Um, so actually it probably could be great. Just choose a very beautiful, sophisticated color. No lime green tree trunk. <laughs> I mean, absolutely lime green tree trunk. <laughs> it is easy for people to find your house. They'd be like, it's the one with the, the ectoplasm cooler uh, tree trunks. Um, so yeah, I, but that kind of stuff is fine um, in, the, in the cold season. We're not worried about humidity. But what you'll see is if you ever want to see the damage of things like that, is if you ever see a tree Whoa. like that that does have one of those corrugated tubes, if you lift it up in the summer, the amount of um, earwigs and pill bugs and things that love rotting debris, those types of insects aren't bad normally, but if there's rotting debris, they will damage healthy plant tissue because they'll just keep eating. So, so that's how you know you got a problem. This type of thing you could have on just in the winter or you could leave it on all year. I have some trees here that I know the deer are going to get right to in September again and I'm too lazy to take it off so I just leave it on the whole season. Do you just do like um, 
zip ties. Zip ties, which I couldn't find today, which is why I don't have any right now. But zip ties are just even, I've even just used little bread ties, just any yeah, kind of any. a wire. Um, so, so that would be yeah, the case with these. Places. Hmm? Leaf three places. Ex exactly. Definitely top, middle, and bottom. Um, you can never overdo it. But, but yeah, you definitely don't want to have it do that thing where it kind of tacos out in the middle and you have this big open. Um, and then if you do leave it on all year, just make sure what, in the spring that you know you kind of make sure there aren't leaf debris and stuff piled up inside there. Um, so usually, like I said, by about mid-March, I start to feel in the clear. If I do want to take them off, I take them off. Um, that's really it for How about mulching? Big... Oh, mulching, yes. So mulch yeah. as high as you can on the tree. <laughs> so oh good my for it. No. Volcano. <laughs> oh my gosh. Volcano <laughs> mulching. Yep. Where I go for family reunion in the UP, they stack oh, mulch yeah. around. Yeah. Like, you want to see tree of use, go to Toledo you Hospital. Are, yeah. Really? Do they do that? Oh, they'll mulch whether oh. they need it or not because it's a contract. I've and dug out those. Like, Mom, it's real bad. No, it's real bad. So, so when you do mulch, what you do want to do is, once again, that's where we're looking for that root flare. And by the way, when we're done planting, when you're officially done replanting, check for that root flare again. Because you see just me, it's not been finished yet. I already had all the soil kicked up against it. Make sure you find that root flare again. I see, you can see right there, I see like a little naked root showing. That's, I got that root flare. When you mulch, you can mulch a couple inches high all around it, just like you would the rest of your yard. You just don't want that mulch piled up against the trunk. So if it's like just a dusting around the trunk just to keep it tidy looking, that's fine. But you don't want it built up around that. So what you would do is... Is that a death for disease? Yes, and disease, that... insects, uh, just the same as the tube being on there, not allowing airflow. Mulch against the tree trunk's going to do the same thing. So you figure in the woods, trees have leaves that get piled up against them, but leaves are lighter than yeah. decaying wood. There's nowhere in nature that we have a three inch layer of decaying wood, but we seem to think that's okay in a yard. So it's like... <laughs> so it's okay where you have those little roots exposed. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Yes, and you could go a little higher with this. I just tried to, I go really overboard just to see if I can see that. But yeah, as, yeah. as long as you see it, just a little bit of root flare. I'm not worried by that point. So the same with the mulching. Get your mulch as much as you need, but within that last couple inches, don't have to mulch that high. <laughs> and um, yeah, you'll have a happy tree. Um, in terms of watering, that first year, um, at least, um, I look, you know, I'll give it, I'll put a hose on it on a trickle for maybe 20 or 30 minutes. Generally in the summer, maybe every four or five days. In, obviously this depends on every yard, every situation. I have some areas here that stay wet, I don't worry about it. Other areas that are very dry, I might check twice a week. What you need to know is, so trees are rated by the caliper of inches. So a tree will say like one inch caliper, two inch caliper, however many inches the caliper is, that's how many years it's going to take to establish, they say. So if you bought a really big tree that's a five inch caliper, it could take five years to really start getting established. That's why they often say a small tree will have caught up to the size of the big tree in that amount of time it took the big tree to start growing. So, so like this tree is very young and that's a, maybe a one inch caliper. So what I'd be saying is, well, I know for at least one full year, I need to really keep a little bit of a closer eye on it. Um, the main thing would be fall with trees, even trees that are a year or two old. I, if we're having a really dry fall, that's when you really want to make sure they're going into the winter hydrated and healthy. So. Um, so I will keep an eye on them. Usually we're lucky here this time of year, but we do have some years where there's just not much rain in the fall. And before the ground freezes, you want that moisture in there, especially with evergreens. You know, evergreens more than anything need to go into the winter hydrated. Um, so, so watering most of the trees here, usually the first two years, no matter what size they are, I keep a, a, a hose nearby. Or you could do, there's those things they call gator bags, like the bags that go around them. That's another one that is super helpful, but if you don't need it because you can reach a tree with a hose, don't use one of those bags. They're, you know, they're, they're really designed for areas that it's hard to get a hose out to. Because you figure that's one more thing laying up against your tree. Um, but I do use them in areas that are hard to get to, you know, then I only have to get a hose out there once a week, fill it up, and then I'm done, you know. So, um, but otherwise, that watering first year is super important. No matter how big the tree is, then that how much longer you might decide you need to 
keep an eye on it. And there's also tree species that are more forgiving than others. You know, some trees are going to really punish you if they dry out quickly, especially evergreens because they can't wilt and tell you when they're dry. Um, and then other trees that you know you could plant like an American elm and forget to water it for three weeks, and it, it will be like, okay, I'm still here. Come on, let's do this. So, a um, willow tree. Yeah, will willow will find its own water. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, that's kind of all that. And then in the, I didn't have any good burlap root ball uh, plants to show today, but I do have drawings in there and stuff. Burlap is um, very similar. The most important thing you can do with the burlap root balls, there's two things. If you can cut the metal cage off, do that. They always said, oh, those break down in the soil. I was trying to get out a root stump from a crab apple here that was 20 years old at least that had died. The stump was this big, there was still an intact cage all over it. Um, so trying, what you can do is at least get them down in the ground with the cage and just cut off at least as much of the cage as you can from in the hole. And then take the, if you plant those, cut the burlap off the top once you plant it in the ground. Because you don't want that burlap up around the tree trunk either. It exists the top then? Yeah, you can leave it, a, it breaks down really quickly in the ground, yeah, but the, um... So the root boom. Exactly, and a lot of nurseries twin, like, tie the burlap off around the tree trunk. And I've seen a lot of trees dying in landscapes where people never removed that because they usually tie it with ropes. So there's ropes tied around the tree and the burlap and the tree can't deal with all that. So plus burlap when it's dry will often wick moisture from, so you could be watering your tree and it's pulling the moisture away from your root ball. So cut that top off. The main thing though, I've dug up about 10 trees here that died since I started that were all planted ball and burlap. And the reason was when people planted them, they never looked to see where the actual root flare was on that tree. When they dig a tree in the field, it kicks a lot of soil up around it and then they wrap it with, with burlap. So if you don't pull back, I dug up five uh, spruces that were all dead when I started. They were all six inches too deep in the ground because that soil kicked up around the roots. The landscapers saw the root ball, said, the top of the root balls here, put it in the ground. Well, the root flare was actually down here. So that won't work. Maybe a swamp tree, like you could maybe do that with the sycamore and it'd be like, all right, but not a Norway spruce. So, um, so that's the, I found with burlap root balls that that's even more, uh, more misleading with the top of the root ball. So you always gotta make sure, and that's why I always dig a hole shallower than I might need from the start because I have a feeling once I actually take the tree out of the pot and start loosening, that root ball's never going to be as big as it looks when it's in the pot or in the, the root ball of the um, burlap. But so, did you say, Ben, it does not in many places sell burlap wraps? Oh, a lot of them still, no, I mean, every still place do. still does. It's just not the common thing. Landscapers, mm -hmm. it's the common, but for the average homeowner, most, is, most purchases are um, um, added. Potted. And I will say, not to betraggle anyone, but some of all the trees that we bought uh, or that I dug up that were dead were all planted professionally. Mm -hmm. um, and they were planted professionally six Five. to eight inches too deep. Yeah, I will not say names because I'm on camera. Um, but, um, but if you want to know later, just email me because I, I love gossip. No, no, but it was one of them when they came out to plant a, a new tree for a Stranahan Memorial. I had them bring their foreman from the nursery to show, show the employees. I said, we can't risk what happened for 20 years. You got to. So, um, so yeah, yeah that's plant a tree for it to die after. Exactly. And a lot of professional it. landscapes I've seen where there's still the ropes tied around the base with the burlap and the trees are dying. And it's, these were put in by professional landscape companies. So, so you got it's good to know this stuff and to be an advocate. If you are paying $400 to have a tree planted, right. don't be ashamed to go out there and check on it when it's being done. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't trust contractors to just go willy nilly with anything else you're spending that much money on. So. So it, don't be ashamed to go out there and say, I just want to make sure, like, let's... I took this class and yeah. I... Yeah. I took this really opinionated guy's class. <laughs> but you could, because the problem with the tree is most trees you buy have a two-year guarantee if you may plant them. It's going to take five years for that tree to die because of those issues, minimum. Yeah. So by the time things are happening, they're long off the hook. Right. And you've grown attached to your tree by then. So it's it's not a great situation. So, okay, so knowing that... Okay, now I have that, a question about... Mm -hmm. This oh, that's good that for it. <laughs> when we were planting, you would just yeah. Let's see. Cut it all the way back. Yes, let's see. So that would be fine. Yeah. So thank you. 
Yeah, it's almost like I was rolling it around all over the ground or something. <laughs> you never would do that. Never! So, um, yeah, so that one, just take a look at that. If you have any questions, um, I forgot to put my email on there, but I'm on the website. We all have our emails on there. If you have any questions, just email me. But um, Deer or wild one? A what? 577. Oh, for 577 on the website, yeah. I'm not on the payroll at Wild Ones yet, Kate. <laughs> but you we'll get what you time. want. Neither are we. <laughs> <laughs> when you figure out. You said that earlier. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're like, really when you figure Kate, out where Kate, that payroll is. Let us know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, did y'all have any questions? Is, is that, is that uh, black gum, is that native? Okay, I, so black gums can be native up here. This one is actually a cultivar, so it would it is uh, selected by humans because this variety, the new growth, is reddish when it's first coming out. So it's called wildfire. Um, black gum. I don't know if it's real common up here, Southern Ohio. We do have, yeah, yeah. we do have stands, stands of, them of it up there. You can see the red on. Yeah, they they tend to. And even, this is the natural new growth color, but black gums do start coloring early, and they have some of the best red fall color. We yeah. have another one on the property. It's just starting to get red leaves. But you've been to Southern Ohio, Southern Indiana. They're very common in the woods. Um, they're a tree that is used a lot by cities now because they're super tolerant of heavy moisture, uh, heavy clay. Being a swamp tree, naturally, they can handle low oxygen in the soil, so they can go in a city parking lot and adapt similarly to a swamp, because both of them have no oxygen. So um, it's also pretty drought tolerant. The problem with black gum is they are a very deep-rooted tree naturally, so they often, that's why you really check out the roots, because there's a good chance it might have a real mess of a root system. Um, but, um, you know what I use? Mm -hmm. uh, Box cutter. Oh, see, and that's a great one. A box cutter is safer. A lot of people would use knives. It's dangerous. Box cutter is much better. Um, in South Carolina, I just had Jaime. He was great for it. But I no, only plant trees that no like Jaime. Is there any right? church for this? Like no, you could have that. It's on the house. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't say. I don't remember seeing a black one. That's North, why I'm interested. I yeah, guess. North Branch Nursery does have oh, yeah, straight yeah. species, so mm -hmm. if you're interested in getting a straight, you know, not a cultivar mm -hmm. for a selection, you, know, yes. you just say, I want a straight species and, of whatever plant. Okay. And okay. good for them, they do have a little native tree area that's like five gallon trees. I have some, like a red oak I planted last year, a little burr oak. I don't know who's in charge of that there, but there's, do you know anything about how that started? Or? No. It's cool. It's all yeah. just like, it's like as straight from nature as they are. They're young trees. Mm -hmm. The younger a tree you can start, the better. I mean, if you put in a two gallon tree, it's going to have the least transition shock of all sizes. But okay, you also have to be more patient. Trees at the sale? Yes, we will have some thought, trees and shrubs at our plants. But they won't be from North Branch, right? They're the ones. They from... won't be from North Branch, no. They yeah. will, um, the Metro Parks has been growing them, but they got the stock from Woody Warehouse. a nursery in India. Yeah, it's Woody Warehouse, I think. Woody Warehouse, yeah. yeah. Which Woody Warehouse is where we got a lot of our natives in South Southern Ohio, and it's a great, great grower of natives. Um, but yeah, black gum is, it's, a, it's becoming quite common in landscaping. The problem is it takes quite a few years to get established, so it will sit. For, it'll probably look this size for a few years, but you never know. Sometimes they'll take off. But um, did y'all have any other questions? No, I'm getting bit. Just, <laughs> just a comment. Is that a question? Uh, <laughs> I talked to the. Why am I getting bit? <laughs> I talked to the grower today who's bringing plants to the um, the Findlay sale this Saturday. Uh -huh. um, he, he's uh, Star Farm natives, and. Um, he will have some trees. Okay. He's bringing trees and uh, plants. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we didn't get to it today, but I will say Carrie at Metro Parks was very generous and did donate two young trees for us to do today, but um, they were in cloth pots, which really isn't as demonstrated because cloth pot root systems are fabulous. They don't, they don't tend to girdle. So I just like thank you. But I do want to say thank you to them, and I do know that they do have a lot of woody well, this time of the year, the time to buy them. It's time to buy them because they're on, they're on Black sale. Black Diamond has, you know, no. fairly good, yeah, smaller trees. Yeah, discount season, and it's the best time of the year. The rare situation in retail where the best time to do it is the cheapest time. That doesn't happen often. In fall, yeah. Yeah. What so. is the? Um, so I've seen the pots that are like root pruning mm -hmm. pots. 
Is yeah. that something that, I mean, I saw them for a while and now I don't think I see them as much. They're wonderful. The reason you don't see them a lot is they're much more expensive. So a lot of nurseries are like, uh-uh. Okay. But the idea being, yeah, the air hitting the roots causes them to not want to grow further. So they don't keep doing the circling around. They just kind of, it, it prunes them. Yeah. The, it dries out the ends of them, yeah. so they just stop. <laughs> but they are pricey pots because even one of the shrubs Carrie gave me, she was like, "Do you mind bringing that pot back?" Here? And I said, "Girl, you got a bag here. I'll take the shrub in a bag." Because so, <laughs> I said, "You know, I'll never remember to bring you that pot." So yeah, the the root pruning pots. They what they do is they're tiered. You know, they kind of have multiple little layers and they have little holes all along those. So the trees in a root pruning pot very often will be almost stair steps like a cone or they'll be just a cylinder with lots of perforations which that's how woody warehouse theirs come in oh, okay. generally that way do they want their pot food? woody warehouse <laughs> you'd have to drive to indianapolis but i'm sure they love them <laughs> but yeah it's a great design and um, Sounds like it, yeah. and it is ideal because you do get a tree and you go you take it out of the pot and you don't do all this and you really worry and that's what was nice with burlap trees, as long as you make sure where that root flare is. You don't have to worry about any of the roots under the ground having yeah. lots that's of bad habits. Good to know, because I would have think you have to take the whole burlap fall off. No, if you, you know, what we do is if we can, since we have a tractor, we'll have the root ball lifted up and we'll cut the whole cage off if we can. But sometimes it's too hard as a homeowner and it can be risky because you can lose the whole root ball fall apart then. So, that's why most people will just put that tree in the ground with the cage on it and then that's why you want to have that hole generously wider. You can get in there with your, you know, your wire cutters and cut as much of that cage off as you can. If there's still that disc of cage underneath the tree, I'm not too worried. It's more when it's coming up around where the roots want to grow through that that's where the cage can be really detrimental. So, I remember being younger. No, I don't want to. Now I know better. Oh yeah. Trim, trim, trim. Beat them up. Do it. You know, before I was like, no. No, we used to always be so nervous. And my grandma always taught me that when she first taught me how to divide pasta, she said, the gentler you are, the more you hurt things sometimes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the plants are very strong. Yeah, they really just make really sure you got a sharp tool and close your eyes and chop. So, so yeah. Um, I think we made it before. Yeah. Does everyone still have most of their blood? Yeah. You know? Who's talking? Yeah, you were like, oh, God. Who's talking? Is this malaria symptoms? It's gotten so dark since we started out here. It has gotten quite dark. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It's all It's past 8. Oh, it's 8.05. 8.05? Oh, my Lord. That's pretty good, Dana. That's pretty good. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs> thank, thank you for having us. And I hope uh, y'all can make it out to the plant sale. This is the first fall. One, first correct? time we've done a fall plant sale. Yeah, and so fall is the best time. Yeah. And especially it's the time that a lot of the natives are showiest. So when is it? Uh, October seventh. October seventh. I got to see what they had out at Metro Parks, and I was salivating. Oh yeah. And we have. Um, not only Metro Parks, but we have UT and then the three independent growers. So we're going to have a nice variety from, from five different yeah. growers. And that's at the Seed Nursery and White House? It's at the Big White Barn, the same place yep. that it was in the spring. So it's the Big White Barn. When you drive into the Seed Nursery, you don't go all the way back. It's the Big White Barn yeah. on the left hand side. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's going to be. I can great. find it once I get there. Yeah. Getting there. It's a historic park. It's pretty big. It's such a cool one. It is. Me. The grand finale. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Take a goose Thanks to go. So do Thanks, you Bennett. help get the stuff Please picked don't. up? Oh, no. Part of being the closer and opener is no one will know this is still here until I get it anymore. <laughs> no, so thank you. I'm so glad to see new faces and familiar faces. And um, I hope y'all each try to plant a tree this fall. We are in a tree crisis, so we really need to yeah. all do our part um, to get what we can in the ground. So Arbor Day will send you. And yeah. you, you buy one. And witch hazel is one of my new oh, no, days. Yes. And like I said, if you ever plant a witch hazel, fence it. Um, yeah. 
immediately. Well, I think it's too late for me. I don't know. I've lost multiple big ones here. They'll cut every oh. branch off and take all the bark off. Rabbits? Rabbits and every animal I likes know. them. And I, yeah. I was so excited about it. They don't eat so the leaves. Coming. They just want the bark. Thank you. So. You want your tags? Oh, yes, thank you. No, I already forgot what this tree was. <laughs> Black gum. That's, that's my fault. I am. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone.